Good evening, brother. <clears throat> I thank the Lord for his mercy. The more I get into this, the more I see um, that it's, um, it's uh, mercy is, is of the Lord. It can't really be found any place else. It, 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 if, you, if you're merciful, then it's, it's this evidence that you've been in contact with God. He, he, he's a merciful God. Now, tonight, and I do apologize, um, this came up kind of quick. As far as I, me and Sister Logan going to have to work together a little more closely. It's not her fault. I was, was ill, and I neglected to get to her, so please forgive me for that. But, um, but tonight, this is, the, uh, this is a good word from the Lord. It's Psalms 52.8. I'm going to focus on, on, on the uh, I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Now, I trust, or another way to say that is it, we would be, we're very familiar with this. As I believe, or how about this, I hope in the mercy. In fact, that those expressions are found in the scriptures over and over. But see, this, this, this thing of trust, now when you look into the Old Covenant scriptures, You'll find that the word trust is used a lot. There's a lot of instances where, where they, 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 they'll testify that they trust in the Lord. They, they have confidence or they have hope in the Lord. And see, in, in, the, in the New Covenant age, we would use the word believe more. But see, this, this, this thing is that it, in faith. You say faith. You have confidence or you have total reliance on, on God to do what he promised he was going to do. And um, the Old Testament is filled with these terms. And trust is... Uh, it, it, he trust is a good word. You, you're, you're actually leaning. Uh, I like this one. Um, this is it's a dictionary definition. It says to be confident or sure, to be bold, confident. Okay? And then one that says careless. I thought, well, that's kind of odd. But let's see, it's not. It's careless. I mean, you're not filled with care about this anymore. You've actually, you've trusted in the Lord, and now that care that was burdening you is gone. Yeah, yeah. You are careless. Yeah, that's See, and I, I thought, you know, I want to be more careless. And in, in some of these matters, not careless like, like negligent. Careless like I don't let this thing burden me because I've given it to the Lord. Whatever it is. You make or you put your trust in, in God. You, you, you do it. You put, you've looked the situation over and you've determined to trust the Lord. I have trusted the Lord in this area, in this matter. David here, he's... I like this thought that he says, I hide for refuge in thy mercy. See, uh, it, 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 you, can't, you can't get any better than this now. You just can't. When you see God, he's a merciful God. See, he, and you come to him humbly you, you, with a contrite heart. And you said, I'm, I'm hiding in you. I'm hoping in you. I'm, I'm trusting that this thing is going to work out for my good. Now, see, we... Everyone who knows the scriptures knows that Paul did this extensively. <laughs> he, he try, he, God put him in, in, in positions where the only way out was to trust in the Lord. Yeah. See, now you know that God's working in you when, when you find yourself doing this. It's not, like, it's not like you're set out. Paul didn't set out to be shipwrecked, did he? No. But see, the circumstance arose, and, and so he, he trusted in the Lord. I'm trusting that this is going to turn out for my good. Now... One of the New Testament words that embodies this, I've already mentioned, is faith. Now, it's interesting. You read these accounts back in the, in the Old Testament of these men, and, and it'll never bring up, it'll never say he, he, he had faith. And it won't say it like that. It'll say it a different way. And then what, yet when the Holy Spirit writes them up, he says they had faith. That's what it says. Because that's really what it was. They were trusting in the Lord. And actually... Technically, they were men before their time. See, the sin hadn't been put away. Technically, if you just look at it, they didn't really have any real reason. I mean, they didn't have a word like we do. And yet, they, they had their confidence in the Lord. This, God's going to work this thing out. We know from, from the Revelation team, we, we're a very unique people. We've been given a word from God. There's no reason for us not to trust in the Lord. We have absolutely zero reason for to, and this day we're living in now, in the day of the open heavens, when sin's been put away, Christ has been exalted at the right hand of the majesty on high, and he's there for you. Now, we have no right, or no, or, or no we, can't, we can't get out of this, 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in Him. Why? Because we, God, God set everything up for our advantage. Amen. Now, Hebrews 11, 6. <clears throat> but without faith, it's impossible to please Him. I'm kind of trying to show you that faith and trust, they are one and the same. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Now, that's, just, that's the same way of saying I trust in the mercy of God. So see, you're, you're coming to God. You believe that He is. Mm -hmm. He really is there. You believe that, so you come unto Him, and then you tr you're trusting that He's going to do the things that He promised. Amen. He's a rewarder. He's gonna re There's not anybody that's ever come to the Lord in, in, a, in a humble and contrite spirit that wasn't rewarded. See, God doesn't, he's, he, he will in no wise cast you out. He won't. Why? Because this is, he's already worked in you if you come to him in a humble and contrite heart. He's already worked in you to make you come. So see, God won't, God's not going to turn away the works of his own hand. So if he's worked in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure, and you're coming to receive from the hand of the Lord, he delights to see you. Yeah. Sin's been put away. Now, although the word faith, and I've already said this, is not much, not found much. It's just a few times. In the old scriptures, we know through the words of the apostles that there were some who possessed it. Now, possessing faith is something that if you do it, you'll trust in the Lord. Nobody with faith doesn't trust, just the way it is. Amen. Abraham, we know in Romans 4, 19, being not weak in faith. But you go back there and you read the account. You'll be hard-pressed to find those exact words. But we know the Holy Spirit writes him up. He was not weak in faith. Amen. He considered not his own body now dead. Is it what, what, he trusted that God was able to do what he said he was going to do. He trusted him. Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Moses, by faith, by faith they did what they did. It was by faith. The Holy Spirit is very careful to bring this up because we need to know God was setting a platform. Uh, God was setting like in real life experience, what it is to have faith. You look back there, Amen. Abraham stands as a, the father of the faithful. You say, well, I, I want faith like that. Well, you see, now this, for him, this was good. For us, see, we, we, we have a much better promises. I'm not saying that we don't, I'm saying that he, that, that was where he started working with men. By faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's what he did. He lived it out. It wasn't like he, somebody told him you shouldn't be the, you shouldn't claim that. He said, I, I'm not going to. He trusted in the Lord. Amen. Over and over, the New Covenant writings were given to understand that these accounts, which hardly ever mention faith, are accounts of how, how God worked faith in those Amen. who he had chosen to establish a foundation of what faith is. Amen. You want to know what faith is? Look in the examples that God's put in the scriptures. He put examples in there. Now you line that up with your own expression, and, and you'll find if you have faith or if you don't have faith. So prophets didn't tell the people that God required faith. You're not going to find that. And there says, you should have faith. Why? Because the law is not a faith. Sin hadn't been put away yet. So see, that's what I'm saying. We live in a very privileged time. Sin's been put away. You can walk with God in your faith, that you believe the record that God's, you're, you're, it's like you're walking right along with him, you're tracking with him in his eternal purpose. Why? Because you have faith. In other words, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the real deal. It's substance. Amen. You've got it. And then, see, you can fellowship with Christ in it. These people that God worked in were objects of God's mercy. Mm -hmm. God worked in them for a reason. He was showing us something, revealing something, God was setting the stage in order that his son could appear and take away sin to bring in a new and a better covenant. These brethren that we read about here in Hebrews 11, they lived through hard times. These were hard spiritual times. And yet, God, see, God used that time, a time when technically they didn't have a lot of revelation, but what they had, they believed. The things that God had told them, they, they didn't let anything get in their way. They believed them, and they used them, and so God used them as a testimony, Amen. all right, of faith. Hebrews eleven thirty two 32 says, and what more shall I say? 
Well, the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms. <laughs> they, well, they didn't have a lot to work with, but that didn't hold them back, did it? See, the word of God's powerful. So God gave them a, they, they, a word, a promise, and they, they went forward with that, subdued kingdoms. Wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouth of lions. I say these things to highlight how important it is to trust in the mercy. See, that's an old covenant phrase, but it's very much found its fulfillment in the new covenant. Amen. We trust in the mercy. Now, I tell you, I'm trusting on the day of judgment. I stand before he's going to do the things that he promised to do. And if he doesn't, I'm in trouble. Each one of these accounts highlights a person. See, God works in people. He, 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 a person that God chose to exemplify what it really means to trust. It's not just a word. You say, I trust in the Lord. Well, you, all right, you, you've made the profession now. Now God's going to bring you through the experience. He's going to find out. Will you really trust in me? When the waters start getting high, yeah, life start, starts getting hard. All right, now what, what's, what, why'd that come on me? You made a profession that you trusted in God. Now God's going to work that out. He's going to find out. The, the, all the personalities and powers in heavenly places, they're looking on. And it doesn't even, doesn't even look like you should be standing. And you're standing. Why? Because you trust in the Lord. You're trusting. And God's getting glory for it because he's working in you both the will and do his good pleasure. So see, God's just like Job. Remember Job? <laughs> Job, yeah, you can't look at Job and say he wasn't trusted in the Lord. <laughs> His own wife said, just curse God and die. Let's just get this over with. He said, you speak like one of the foolish women. He said, should I receive good for the Lord and not evil? What was he doing? He was trusting in the mercy. That's what he was doing. Amen. Amen. They trusted in the mercy of God. Psalms 33, 8, 10 says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Are you hoping in his mercy tonight? The eye of the Lord's on you. See, he's, he, he's keeping you right in his eyesight. He's, look at this now. Principalities and powers, I'm going to send some trouble to my people. I want you to see how they stand. How they'll hope in the mercy. Amen. Even though it doesn't make any sense to do that. Amen. See, God's mercy is reliable. God's mercy does something. If it, if it didn't do anything, well, then what are we talking about? What good is it? But it does something, and when his people see that God can't lie, God's not going to lie to them. Now they start trusting in that mercy. Now Rahab, she had heard many accounts of the God of the Israelites. Now, see, now this is 40 years later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Old Rahab, she's, she's thinking, well, you know, they're coming closer. We hear reports they're coming. They're getting closer now. And before she knew it, she had a few of them right there in her inn. <laughs> right there. We have representatives from the God of Israel. Well, what did she have to do? She had to choose sides. She had to think on her feet. What am I going to do? I mean, I've heard the stories. We've all been trembling here, you know. Jericho, we've been a trembling. But you know what? She chose sides. And later, she found out that was a good thing to do. See, see, it didn't really do, all the stories didn't really do her any good until she started trusting in the mercy. See, she had to trust that, that God was going to do what these men said he was going to do. <laughs> she didn't have any, I don't read anywhere where God appeared to her. Do you? I don't think it's in there. God didn't appear to her and give her a special word. She had a representative right there in front of her. And he said, Amen. if you do this, Later on, we'll take care of you. And, and believe me, when the dust settled, Rahab was glad she trusted in the mercy. Yes, go ahead. Well, we could do the same thing. With each one of these accounts in scriptures, we could go through and we could find that there was a time in each one of these people's lives when they had to make a decision. They had to come and they had to make a judgment. I'm, and, and see, all the ones that we have record of that made the decision to trust God, they all came out on top. Every one of them. Every one of them. Daniel in the morning, when the king come, and he said, Daniel, and he, Daniel said, oh, king, live forever. He, he was trusted in the mercy. The king was even happy that he trusted in the mercy. <laughs> it didn't go well for his enemies, though, did it? 
Psalms 50, or Psalms 13, 5 says, I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Yeah. You, just, you start to trust it in God in his salvation. See, you start, it, it creates a hope. It, fire, the fire of hope burns in trust. It's like I'm trusting in God. Well, he's going to, he's going to turn out for your salvation. That's what's going to happen. We who are in Christ have been given better promises. Now, see, the, we look at all the record that God's given of a son, the record, the testimonies of these, these, um, the, the, these who trusted in the Lord. But see, in the new covenant, everything's been ratcheted up. Everything's better. Yeah. All the promises are better. All the blessings are better. Yeah. You start finding out what the end of this verse means. It says, forever and ever. So they don't really know what that meant. What that means is going to go on. What, what, they didn't have a whole lot of revelation, but we do. Yeah. Jesus get, comes on the scene, and he starts talking about everlasting life Amen. over and over and over. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but I, it's pretty good. Right. See, God's given the church precious things. It, these things, they can't be understood by flesh. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the things of God. See, the mind of the flesh is contrary to the things of God. There, it's contrary. So you can't, you can't bring these things and dumb them down and try to serve it up to the flesh because they, it's not going to know what to do with it. I, I, I already know that I'm not going to live forever and ever. Flesh is not interested in stuff like that. Say, well, if I could live here forever and ever, I'd be interested in it. But see, it can't. So see, it's like it doesn't know what to do with these things. But God's created an environment in the church where faith can flourish. See? Yeah. Can't really flourish in the world. Can't, it can't, doesn't know how to flourish in the world. But God's created a special environment called the body of Christ where the things of God can be seen as they are precious. Yeah. Christ becomes precious. See, this is all in accordance with what he promised. Remember, we're talking about trusting in the Lord, which means that God said something, God's revealed something that requires you to believe it or trust in it or have faith in it. Jeremiah 31, 33, you all know this. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Aren't you glad we're living in the after those days time? Amen. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their own parts. They'll want to do this. I wrote it inside of them. It's a part of them now. It will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me. Now, this is the environment that I'm talking about, an environment where they all know him. They all have a desire for him. They all have a desire to please him. Now, in that environment, you say, Trust in the Lord. Hope in his mercy. It means something. It's like, I know what you're talking about. I'm hoping in his mercy, too. God's made a commitment in the new covenant to make himself known to those that trust in him. You trusted in the Lord? Well, here comes the revelation. God's going to open things up to you. You're a very special person in the eyes of God, and, and he'll open up. He'll show you his covenant. He'll show you the messenger of the covenant. Remember, this is the same God that revealed himself to Moses way back there in Exodus 34, 5. It's the same God. God hasn't altered. God hasn't changed at all. So you read back here, God put an introduction to himself in these old covenant scriptures, these accounts of scriptures when Moses encounters God and he puts his hand and he comes before him and he makes this declaration, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and it will by no means clear the guilty. God hasn't changed at all. He's the same person, the same character. It's just that now, under the new covenant, he's brought us up to speed, as it were, to where now he's, in, in, he's taken away our sin, he's given us a new heart, and he's put us in Christ Jesus. <laughs> there can be no better blessing than this. There can be no greater environment than this. Amen. You want to know God? The only place you can really get to know him is in Christ Jesus. Right. And yet still, only God could do this. Oh, this is only something God could do. And of course, this is why he's doing it. He, he's, he showed all these, these types and shadows, these examples, these illustrations and, and working in the lives of men. To, to the degree to get men to the point 
to where now in the new covenant, in Christ, you can finally look back and say, this is that. I can see now why you by no means will clear the guilty. It's not out of line now. It's not out of order. In fact, I'm in agreement with you. Yes. If you're going to stay in the category of guilty, yeah. then you cannot be clear. You can't. Yeah. You got to get out of that category. Yeah. And the, 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 the highlight of mercy is that he's made a way that you can get out of the category. Yeah. You don't have to stay a sinner. You don't. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same God that they trusted in. But see, they saw it from a slightly different perspective. And yet they trusted in him. And now, in Christ Jesus, you can look back and say, I don't know why you trusted in him. It's the same faith. Faith hadn't changed at all either. It's the same faith. You, you, he, they relied. They trusted that God was going to do something that they couldn't do. Yes, amen. How's Abraham... I mean, let's look, put yourself in his shoes. How's he going to make himself or make Sarah have a baby? How's it going to happen? He, he had to come to the point to where he had to say, I trust in your mercy. I am trusting that you're going to do this because I can't do it. This is the same God that the holy prophets trusted in. They, they saw things that weren't even for them. They, they couldn't have them. They, they longed for them. They, they saw them afar off, and they were persuaded that they were true. They trusted God, and yet they never got what you have. Oh, I tell you, this is, Malachi wrote this. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, the death of Christ has not changed God. Amen. Now, I know in our day, People may not say it out loud, but they are implying all over the place that the death of Christ, that sin's been taken away, and it's altered God's perception of sin, and that's just a lie. Right. God just as offended right now of sin as he ever was. Amen. In fact, it may even be more. His own son died to take away sin. How dare anyone that professes Christ willfully sin? Sin being put away has not changed God's ability to look upon sin. He still hates it. He still, his eyes are still too holy to look upon it. This is the same God who's presently speaking through the appointed one. See, he's got one at his right hand now. The one that took away sins, right? If it wasn't there, we've been consumed a long time ago. If Jesus hadn't sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, God would have, as it were, got sick of this condition. But he put him there right at his own right hand. And he put him in charge of all things. Why? Because he is the one that took sin away. So now God can be merciful. God's mercy can be expressed because of the Holy One. Amen. He's sitting next to God and he's saying, Father, I took away sin. Let's give them the gifts. Let's give them the blessings. Let's, let's pour out on them the remedy for this situation. See, 2 Timothy 1.7 Paul highlights this God. This is the God that's working in the church. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us. He saved us, and he called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ before the world began. Now the fulfillment of the eternal purpose of God is being worked out and demonstrated in all those who have put their trust in him. Amen. See, it may seem like a light thing to some people in the world when they hear one of the young people testify that they know Jesus, that they love Christ. This is a precious thing. This is a precious thing. See, this is... God's working among us. He's working in, in, in those who have put their trust in him. And see, he's not only has he taken their sin away, but he's, he, he's taken it to the next step. He's now becoming familiar, letting them become familiar with him. Since sin has been put away by the sacrifice of Christ's son, the effectual understanding of God's eternal purpose is being made known to those who've been made accepted. In other words, it's not right to be ignorant of God's eternal purpose. Amen. Everything that God's gone through, 
everything that Christ has gone through, everything the Holy Spirit has experienced in the earth, it's all been towards this maturing the body of Christ, yeah. bringing them to a place where in eternity they'll be effectual workers. But they are going to be. The body, the Holy Spirit says that like this. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now Paul's been given to see the significance of the working of the gospel of peace. This has brought about something that could only be brought about by faith. Yeah. See, this is the only way. The only way that you can grow up in the Christ is by trusting him. Can't be done any other way. You can't, you can't mandate this for somebody else and say, you better trust it. Well, you better, but see this, until a, until a person gets a hold of this, until they, through application of them, some self, giving themselves to the Lord, that they rely, they hope, they trust that God's going to do everything he promised to do. Amen. Then, see, now this is where the work gets, your work gets started now. Paul knew that God was using the seemingly mundane trials and tribulations associated with being in this world to purify and perfect his faith. Paul knew this. Did that, Paul didn't gripe when he was a day and a night and a deep. He wasn't there, oh, what do I do now? What do I do to get in here? And that's, not, that's not Paul. Paul knew that these things were working for him. That these were like, you see, these things were perfecting him or bringing him to a, to a, to a, a greater understanding of what God was doing in Christ Jesus. And speaking of his trials, this is how Paul talked. I like to think about this and lay it up against my own trials to see, do I think like this? Is this how I think? For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed in, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed against, uh, unto him against that day. These things, these things don't move me. These aren't the things that, I, that I'm worried about, I'm concerned about. See, it was the care of the church that came on him every day. Yeah. It wasn't, do I, am I going to have to be beaten again? He cared about things that only God could help him accomplish. Amen. I know whom I believed in. I know, can, can you say that? See, I know that, yeah, that see, when you're with Christ, this, is, this, is, this comes out of your mouth. I know whom I believed in. That when you're trusting the Lord, this is like an answer to a lot of problems Amen. that you can't really get rid of any other way. You just got to trust in the Lord. Amen. I know whom I believe in. Now, what's Paul saying? I know whom I believe in. This is what he's saying. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Amen. That's what he's saying. It's the same thought, the same mind. The mercy of God will outlast our present circumstance. It will. See, after it's all burned up, after the smoke is settled and we're there with the Lord, we'll find out his mercy endures forever and ever. Amen. Isaiah spoke of God being strength, song, and salvation. Remember Isaiah 12 too? Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall I draw waters out of the well of salvation. This is something I can think about a lot. It's something I can partake of a lot. When I start seeing God for who he really is, I get stronger. I'm able to endure. Now, Nahum, he spoke about the one who was the stronghold. Nahum 1, Nahum 1 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust him. He, he knoweth them. <laughs> I want to be known of God. See, there's not really any other reason to be here on the earth. If you don't know God in the end, what, what was your life even about? I mean, you wasted and squandered everything that God gave you. It was all in, in, in the direction that you might know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul labored this point to the Romans. He said, Romans 15, 12, and again, Isaiah say, there shall be a root of Jesse and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now, see, we find ourselves in this category called the Gentiles. Now, I just read something there that if you're in Christ, God's given the Gentiles to trust in him. Well, see, I say, I take, I say amen to that. I'll, I'll trust in him. I'll take the grace that he's given and trust in him. 
I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Those who are in Christ are banking on the forever and ever aspect of this promise. Yeah. You're banking on it because you know eventually you're going to have to either die or Jesus is going to come back and you're going to be transformed. One of the two, one of the two is going to happen. And you're, you're banking on this that because really you, you don't have any power over it. You don't have any power over it when the elements are melting. I don't know of any man he's going to reference and say, what do you think? Do you think I should do this? This isn't not God. He doesn't take counsel from men. God's doing his own purpose and his eternal purpose. There's a day slated where the elements are going to melt. We don't have any control over that. And I praise God for that. Amen. But see, those who are in Christ are banking on God doing what he promised. Amen. Forever and ever. Jesus opened up, and I already mentioned this, but I just want to give a few references here to some of the things that Jesus said. Jesus did not speak like any other man that ever lived. Right. When he starts talking, your ears kind of get perked up. John 6, 40 says, And this is the will of him that sent me. You want to know what God's will is? Here it is. That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Amen. I'll put that in the context. Even if the context today, today, you ask somebody, what is everlasting life? But they may not even understand what that word is either. John 3, 16. Now, this is the part that, that stuck out to me. That whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. Now, see, the, are you believing in him? Well, see, the, the, this other part is, is the natural fulfillment of believing in him. Everlasting life. Life that will never cease. To, this morning we talked more about the quality of that life. John 5, 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself. So, see, so he can give it to whoever he wants. Amen. This is Jesus. This is the one who has life. You believe in him, he's going to give you everlasting life. Amen. John 3, 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You believe it on the Son, you've already got it. It's already working in you, this everlasting life. John 4, 14, But whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You're already becoming familiar with this life. John 10, 10 said, The thief cometh not, but for the still, to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. We don't just want a little pathetic life, something that's barely alive. We want everlasting life. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Amen. See, you're trusting in the mercy of the Lord. He said he won't, you, won't, you won't be condemned, and you're trusting that you won't be condemned. Amen. No condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. This has already happened. We're already anticipating this life continuing forever and ever. Amen. John 6, 27, Labor not for the meat that perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. So the thing that Christ has given you right now is preparing you to continue with him forever and ever. Amen. Which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him that God, for him hath the, God the Father steals. John 6, 46, Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God. He has seen the Father, very, very, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, do you believe that? You believe all those things I just read there about everlasting life? You believe that? Well, then see, well, what? you're trusting in the mercy of God forever and ever. That's what happened. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, these are written, that you may have, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Amen. You don't have it because of something you did. You have it because you believed on his name. Amen. He's the one that has life. And he's the one that can dispense it and give it to you. So you want to mature in Christ? You get closer to Christ. You get closer to Jesus and you will mature. He'll, he'll bring you, Amen. bring you to the Father. Jesus brought life and immortality to light. In other words, he put a handle on what forever and ever means. Jesus opened it up and he made it understandable so that we can actually start hoping for the things that he's getting ready to bring to us. The eternal purpose of God stands assured. He knows them that are his. And when you trust in his mercy, you're confident that even death cannot separate you from his love. 
See, Paul talked about this. It's not able. These things are not able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. They're not even able to do it. So see, we trust in his mercy. We trust that he's going to do. When you trust in his mercy, you're confident. You're confident in him. It's not, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen between now and that day when you stand before him. But see, if you're trusting in him, it, you'll get past it. You'll be able to go through it. You'll be able to go through it and triumph in it. There is a, I like this view. There's, you see scriptures of different views, and this is a good view. I like the after the worms have eaten my flesh view. You know, that's a view, isn't it? It's after, after my flesh has done been eaten by worms. I know. Job testified about this, didn't he? Yes. Job 19.25, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. What happened to Job? Faith worked in him, and he trusted in the mercy of God. Amen. Well, this, um, for me, this has been a delight. It's been a delight. Now, Paul, Paul, um, Paul saw a lot. Paul was given a lot because he was only one apostle sent to the Gentiles, the people who didn't know anything about God, and so God gave him a lot. And he went out and he opened it up, didn't he? He opened it. He showed us what these things mean. God worked in him mightily. So I'll close with these very salient words from our brother Paul. And I'm going to paraphrase from Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. I won't read it all, although it's good to read all of it. We've been given grace whereby we may believe the record that God's given of His Son. Now listen to this. This is, what, this is just the highlights of these 14 or so verses. God's chosen us. He's predestinated us. He's adopted us according to the good pleasure of His will. He has made us accepted. He's redeemed us through His blood. He's forgiven us of sins. He's abounded towards us. He's made known the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. Amen. Now, this is what God's going to do. He's going to gather us together in one. He's going to give us an inheritance. He's going to give us a new body according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. Paul saw this, and the way that Paul so eloquently spoke it to the, to the body of Christ is that, that they could grow up in the Christ, that they could see. It's like when you listen to Paul and you start understanding, it's like he wipes the glass off some, yeah. gets some of the fog off the glass, Amen. and you can see it clear. And what happens? You're changed into the same image from glory to glory. Amen. You start to say, I, I've hoped and I've trusted in the in the God of mercy, and, and now I'm finding myself every moment I'm trusting more, I'm hoping more. I just can't stand it until I get what he's promised. Well, I praise God for Brother Paul. I'm not implying, and I, I, I kind of felt the need to say this uh, in the time we're living in. I'm not implying that the will of man's not involved in what I just spoke about. It is true that God's, every one of these things that I mentioned here, God's going to do. God's doing it. And I praise God that he's the one doing it. He didn't leave this up to men. But see, there's, there's, we're involved in it, obviously, this by the nature of the things he said. It pulls us in. It, it, it inflames our hope. We're involved in it, in other words. But we're called to trust. Yeah, we're called to trust. We're called to believe. We're called to walk by faith. All of those involve us doing, seeing what God said, entering into it, believing it, trusting in it. Salvation, the bottom line, salvation has more to do with God than it has to do with us. And so see, the way that he's worded this, the way that, that David worded this, he gave the glory to God. I have hoped in thy mercy. I've trusted in thy mercy. It wasn't anything David did. David saw a glimpse, I get this, David saw a glimpse of what we were going to have all the time in Christ, and he loved it. He said, how I love thy law. I have trusted in the mercy of God forever and ever. Praise God. Thank you, brethren. Amen.